Let's go to the Lord for just a moment of prayer together. Heavenly Father, your word is powerful and it is alive. And so this morning as we open it, use it to teach us and to challenge us and to bring us encouragement that our lives would be refreshed, that our hearts would be restored, and that our joy would be renewed in you, Jesus. And it's to your glory and through your name we pray. Amen. Not long ago, I was doing a Google search online for the phrase, most influential people in history that people have never heard of. Maybe you've done something like that. I, I pulled up this list, and in the Google list there, there was a, a book. And so I clicked on that to do a little bit of research, and it was this book. It was called The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. As I was looking through the list, I, I was intrigued with this list. And it, it, coming in at number seven, I was really surprised on this list, there was a person at number seven that ranked above uh, Einstein and Louis Pasteur. Remember the pasteurization? Uh, uh, but he uh, above Galileo, who invented the telescope. Number seven is this guy right here. How many of y'all have ever seen or heard of Cy Loon? Cy Loon. He, this guy, number seven on the list, was credited with inventing paper. Of all things, like before him in the second century BC, he they were using animal skins and and, and those kind of things and different methods. But but Sai he figured out a method using bark and and old fish nets and rags to come up with a method where he could make big sheets of paper. And he, he was celebrated in his methods. Some of his methods are still even used to this very day in paper making. See, most people, if you would be honest, you're like, I don't, I've never heard of this guy before. Like, we, we may not know his name, but every day we are impacted and affected by his influence. God, he's placed us on this planet, and he says, I put in you a desire to, to live a significant life, to, to make an influence in this life long beyond your years here. But here's the, the problem that we face in our lives. Many times we, we, we want to do something significant and leave a legacy, but we get caught up in the mundane of the day-to-day -day of our circumstances. And we, we find ourselves in this rinse and repeat cycle of every day I get up and I do my thing and I'm just, and I'm so tunnel visioned on my life that sometimes I can miss opportunities around me that God wants me to be aware of, to use me, to make an influence that's gonna outlive my life. That's his heart for you and me is to, to use us in a powerful way. And so this morning we launch into a brand new sermon series called Unnamed. And it's based on a book by Chris Travis, Unnamed, Unsuspecting Heroes that were singled out by God. And the big idea of this series that we're gonna be in over the next several weeks is, is this right here, is that God primarily works through everyday people. Yeah, there's, there's a handful of people that have a big influence. I mean, if you look out on, in the media, there's a guy like Robert Jeffers, you know, over in Dallas that he's got a, a big, you know, he's got a big touch of out there with the media. But, but the truth is that, that God's been calling people that are just ordinary people, everyday people that are unpolished People that are that, that seem uncertain about everything in, in, in the Bible, and, and they still have questions, but God has been calling and tapping unnamed and uncertain and unpolished people throughout history. And he wants us today to, to learn this. He says, I want you to, to live your life with eyes of faith, to be on the lookout, to be aware of opportunities that I'm gonna be putting right in front of you to make a significant impact with your life that's gonna outlive your time on this planet. Listen to what Paul teaches us in Colossians. He says this to us, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Are you making the most of every opportunity? We, we get so focused in sometimes, but God is he's calling us to, to have eyes of faith, to be aware of the opportunities he's putting before us to make an incredible impact. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, I wanna invite you to open to 2 Kings in the Old Testament chapter five as we 
dive into a story about an everyday person who did the unexpected and how that changed everything. God prompts unexpected heroes to do the unexpected. God prompts unexpected heroes to do the unexpected. And so as we get into this story this morning in 2 Kings 5, let's take a moment to, to just look at the backdrop, the backstory of what's going on in this portion of scripture that we land in in the Bible this morning. Remember over there, it, God's people, the Israelites, were there in the promised land. And then after King Solomon, there was a division. And there was a split in the kingdom. And you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Well, in the, the northern kingdom of Israel, they found themselves at odds with the people of Aram, which is now northern, it's modern-day Syria up there where Damascus is. And so you have northern Israel in conflict with Aram, and they were... The people of Aram would constantly come over there and, and pester and terrorize the Israelites. They would run these raids into their camps and, and take things and people. So here we are in this portion of scripture where with the northern kingdom and Aram. And let's pick it up here in verse one of chapter five. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And so right off the bat, we see this character in the story, Naaman. One time somebody went up to him and they said, hey, what's your name, man? Okay, that was a bad joke. That was a, 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 just a, a dad joke, but I will never use that one again. Okay, so here we have Naaman. He's the commander of the, of the army of Aram. And he's, a, it, the Bible says, a great man. He was great because he had great power and, and wealth, the Bible says. And, and scholars say that he was a rich man. He was in the favor of his supervisor, the king. He was respected he was a very brave man in battle. And then if you look though at the end of verse one, there's a phrase that, that kind of slips by if you're not careful. It says, but he had leprosy. Here's a man that had seemed like everything, the wind at his back in life. He had it all. He had power, money. He had people following him. He could command. And then he had the, but he had leprosy. Isn't that how our lives sometimes go? I mean, we set out to live the, the perfect, get the perfect job to be the perfect mom or dad and parent and have the perfect kids. And then all of a sudden, but fill in the blank hits us, doesn't it? But here's the name and he, he has it all, but he had leprosy. Back in this culture in biblical times, leprosy was, was considered one of the most feared diseases that you could get. It was so contagious. It, was, it would cause sores on people's skins, and it, it was debilitating. It was painful. People would, would shun you if you had leprosy. And so here we see Naaman, this powerful man, right off the bat. He's, he's the commander of armies of fearless warriors. But I imagine that at this moment in his life, as the leprosy began to grow, he, he didn't feel powerful. He felt powerless. Let's move on in verse two. Now, bands of raiders from Aram, Aram had gone out and taken a captive, a young girl from Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. She's easy to overlook. She might be insignificant by earthly standards, and she only appears in a, a few verses in the Bible, and it's right here in Scripture, these verses right here. We don't even get her name. Do you see her? She's this young girl from Israel. She's been taken captive. So here she is. She's been taken captive from Israel her family in Israel, and now she finds herself over here in Aram, and so we don't have the details on how she was captured, on how the raid went down, but I can imagine maybe it was in the night, and the army swept in, and, and there was chaos, and there was torches, and there was swords, and there was a raid, and she was snatched from her family. We don't know if her parents survived or if 
they were taking slaves as well, but she finds herself in captivity. Now, she's the maid to Naaman's wife. Of all people that, where she could have ended up, she was taken captive, and now she finds herself in the house of the one who is actually in charge of the people who raided her and took her into captivity. So now she's serving this this man. And so can you imagine from her perspective, this, this unnamed servant girl, her perspective is she is there serving. She's been ripped from her family. And she sees this, this man, Damon, the commander, suffering with leprosy. What do you think her first inclination might be? It'd be like, good, serves him right. After all the pain he's inflicted, it serves him right that he would get leprosy. I hope that it just gets worse and, and it gets worse and that he suffers. That's just, that would be a little, little justice for him. But not this girl, not this unnamed girl here in the scripture. She did something unexpected. Let's move on in verse three. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So she, instead of looking with, with anger, she looked at her, her supervisor, this man, her master, with compassion in her eyes, and she offered a solution. And she told about where this man could get help for what was ailing him. She showed great kindness. What a, what a moment that was in this story. It'd be easy to overlook that she's there, this unnamed girl. Nobody knows, and she just makes an innocent suggestion to Naaman's wife. And what a moment. She did what, what, what we might not expect. Isn't that how God works in our lives, that he does the, the unexpected? We, we expect justice, but God says, I'm gonna give grace we expect her to operate in, 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 in humanity and want justice. But this young lady, she, on this day, gives grace. There's so many other things that she might have said in this moment. If you think about this for just a moment, what else could she have done? She could have used this as a leverage, his leprosy and, and, and this prophet news. She could have said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get something out of this, some I'm gonna get my freedom. I'll tell you about this thing. If you'll, if you'll take me back to Israel with you, but what does she do? She doesn't ask for anything. She simply offers a suggestion from a pure heart. She was in the moment prompted by God with eyes of faith. She was available to be used and she offers this. She was holding all the, the cards, but she didn't shrink back from this moment. No, she, she stepped up. Instead of focusing just on her needs, she focused on the needs of her enemy. So this morning, we're gonna see that unexpected grace leads to unexpected change. The simple suggestion of this little girl set off a chain of events that was about to unfold in the story, and I just wanna give you a brief summary of how it unfolds, and you can go back and take time to read it in detail later, but she makes the suggestion about the prophet, and so Naaman's wife goes to him and tells him, and so Naaman is excited for the hope that he might be cured. He goes to the king of Aram, and he says, hey, I wanna go and see this prophet. And so the king of Aram says, yes, my, my great commander, I wanna support this. So the king writes a letter to the king of Israel and he tells Naaman, here, take all of these, these hundreds of pounds of gold and silver and cloth and as a gift, you're gonna go over. And so the letter is sent over here to the king of Israel. The king gets the letter from the other king and, and the king of Israel, he's, he's panicked. He says, what, what? How, he sends me a man to, to cure him of leprosy? Who does he think I am, so, uh, that I'm God? That I can do this great thing? And he's distressed, he's thinking, he's just inciting me into another battle. He's trying to pick a fight. He was tearing his robes and Elisha, the great prophet over here, he got wind of what was going on and he sent word to his king and he said, hey, send Naaman over to see me and I'm gonna show him. God's gonna show him that there is a prophet in Israel. 
So Naaman, he loads up his crew and I can just see he's got a caravan of some chariots and horses and all the gold and he's setting out across the countryside and he's going to find the prophet. He shows up over there and the king says, go see Elisha. And so here's, here's Naaman, can you see it? He, he's at the king's palace in his pomp and his power and his position and in and, and his money and he's out there seeking maybe to, to, to go buy this miracle that he thinks is gonna cost so much. And the king says, go and see Elisha. So he loads up all his caravan, he leaves the palace. They're going over to the, to the other side of town where the, where the prophet lives and they roll up in his driveway and I can just say he's there and he's like, go get the, go get the prophet. What happens? Elisha's inside. He doesn't even go out and greet him. He sends out a, his messenger to Naaman and he says to Naaman, I'm gonna give you just a simple prescription. Go and dip yourself and wash in the Jordan River seven times and you will be healed. You would think this is great news, but, but Naaman in his pride, he was so, he was incensed. The Bible says he, he flew into a rage. How could he not even have the dignity to come out here and talk to me? He, he, like I am Naaman the commander and he, did, he sends this guy out. What is all of this? He is angry. He's furious. Let's listen to what he says in verse 11. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the, the waters of Israel? Couldn't I just wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and he went off in a rage. There's two words that jump out at the beginning of verse 11. There are two words that have, I know, have tripped me up in my own life, and they, they, they cause so many of us to stumble. What did Naaman say? He says, I thought. I thought. How many times have those two words messed up your, I thought. God, I, I, I came over here, and I, I trusted you, and, and I thought that you would, you would. God said, I know. It's not your plan. It's my plan. I thought why the Jordan River God ew, that's yuck that's if you've been over there it says it's like a muddy little stream in places right here it's not the grand clear crystal waters of Damascus that he was entitled to and used to bathing in I thought Elijah would come out and and wave his hand over the spot and it would be cleansed he didn't realize though that morning, that day, that God wasn't interested in that spot. God had his eyes on another spot in Naaman's life. He, God was more not interested in, in just healing Naaman's skin. He wanted to create faith in Naaman's heart. I thought, but God has another plan. Naaman, he is angry, he's furious. He's about to storm off. He's about to say to his men, everybody, forget this. What is this? Lo load up. We're, we're heading back to Aram. You know, I can on one hand admire Naaman for seeking, for making the journey. But I can also relate sometimes to Naaman wanting to just turn around and, and go and just get out of here to almost leaving, but listen to what happens in verse 13. Naaman's servants, he, they went to him and said, my father, his servants loved him. He was a commander, but they, they felt for him and they loved this man and they said, my father, and they're trying to talk some sense into him. If the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So Naaman listened. And he went down to the river. Picture the scene for just a moment. He is at Elisha's, Elisha's house and he leaves there with his entourage. They go down to the river. I'm sure he pulls up and there, all his men are lining with their gleaming armor and swords along the banks. And Naaman's like looking at the river probably. <sighs> he 
he takes off and disrobes his, his armor and he begins to step a toe into the river and he's probably grimacing as the silt begins to go between his feet and, and, and he's thinking, what is this? And he, he says, okay, God, Let's, let's see what, what, what you got. And as he, he begins to, to go into the water, I'm sure that if we could listen to the internal dialogue that was going on in his mind at this moment, we would hear something like this as he dips down into the water the first time. This is, this is so ridiculous. Why did I make this journey? Maybe on the second time he, he went down and he's splashing water on his skin and he's saying, Lord, I need you to come through. I've tried everything else, uh, please. And he goes down and again, and he's splashing, and doubts begin to creep back into his mind. And he's like, I can just hear the, my men on the shore. They're probably just laughing to themselves. That servant girl back in, in Israel, back in Aram in my house is probably laughing to herself right now. He dips down again, and he splashes, and he, he begins to sense a change in his heart as He's running out of hope in himself and he, he's crying out in his heart and his mind, Lord, let me not lose my dignity, but, but Lord, let me gain your healing today. And as he went down that last time, look what the Bible says in verse 14. He went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him in his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Wow, can you imagine? He, he went there and he, and he comes up out of the water and he's restored in this moment. I can just think, he was saying, God, the Lord God of Israel is the one true God. He is the healer. He is God. And he went out and he rejoiced and in this moment, he, his skin was made brand new. It was more than just a, a cleansing of his skin, though, in this moment. It was like a rebirth in his heart. It was more than just a physical healing. It was a, it was a spiritual healing in the man's heart as God demonstrates his great power. How can ordinary water bring such a miracle? Ordinary water connected with the promise of God and the waters of baptism brought you into the family of faith by his grace alone. It wasn't the, the magical power of any water. It was the promise connected. And so we receive that and God calls us into his family and he cures us of a disease that's deep within us that's worse than any leprosy. It's a disease of sin that distorts our view of God and, and, and we question him and it, it distorts our view of ourselves and it makes us greater in our own eyes than we really are. God says, I've come to bring you healing Naaman came for a cure, but he left cleansed. He gets everybody on the scene. He, he says, we're heading back over to Elisha, Elisha's house now. He gets them, and they, they make their way back to go say thank you to him and to God. Remember the story of, of Jesus in the New Testament, the lepers he cleansed, and there was 10 of them, but nine of them left, only one came back. And here's, here's Naaman. He said, I'm gonna go back and give thanks to the Lord. He shows up at Elisha's, and now he's not coming with an offering to buy his healing. He's coming with this gift to say thank you, God. And the Bible says that he loaded up some loads of dirt there. Some, some soil, some dirt from Israel. And he said, I'm gonna take this back to my land and my home and I'm gonna build an altar and we're gonna worship the one true living God. What an incredible turn of events. Who could have ever imagined that by the faith in, in the heart of this servant girl that she would feel the prompting of God to talk about this, this healing that he could find. And, and so it started this turn of events that led to him getting healed and his heart changed. And now he's going back to his nation, bringing and declaring the praise of Almighty God. Isn't that incredible?
love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus here in this text, he didn't just make a suggestion. No, Jesus, he, he lived it out, he demonstrated, he said, forgive them. Remember, he was on the cross hanging there, dying on a sinner's cross that wasn't his, it was for you and for me. And, and as he was there and his lifeblood is draining from his body and his spirit is crying out to his father, he looks with eyes of love into the cry to the crowd that has just hung him there and he says what? Father, forgive them. He set the example and he calls us and he, he's speaking today, are you listening? He says, how will you respond in your life? And I wanna give you a couple little action steps this morning as we wrap this up that you can take and reflect on this week in your prayer time. And the first thing that you can do today is on your way out, you can stop at the connection counter and there's gonna be some cards out there uh, that we've put together and each week in this series, you can pick up a different one and put it in your Bible and on the back there's some daily things you can reflect on. And today, this is unexpected Naaman's servant girl, take one of these. And then as you get that in this week, I wanna ask you to do this, to ask yourself, how would expecting the unexpected change the way that I spend time with God? If there was gonna be unexpected, how would it change the way that I spend, uh, but I like, God, help. To work through you and to be your strength when you are weak. The second thing is this pray for eyes of faith to see unexpected opportunities. Pray for Him to open the eyes of your heart. Remember that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. I want to see you at work. Lord, help me to be aware of your promptings and help me to make an impact for you, Jesus. See, this morning I believe this that if you will live with eyes of faith and you will act with courage. That like this little servant girl in the story, you might just find that God is gonna use you in an unexpected way to make an incredible impact on this planet that's gonna outlive your life, not for the glory of your own name, but for the renown of the name of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Amen. This morning we have an opportunity to declare that faith that lives in us together with God's people in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so I wanna invite you to stand with me right now as we join together our voices as we declare, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. <clears throat> from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated for just a moment. At this point in our service, we'd like to, to recognize and honor our mothers. And so moms, if you're here with us this morning, we wanna invite you to, to be safe and socially distanced, but we'd like you to come up along the front here if you feel comfortable doing that. and. Our elders and men have a special gift for you this morning. So, so ladies, moms, if you would come on up, we'd like to do a special prayer of blessing over you. As they're making their way up, let me point out that out in our connection counter, you can pick up one of these cards. Our emphasis this month of ministry is the Metroplex Women's Clinic, and we're taking donations for supplies to help in that ministry, and you can bring supplies or you can go online and make a, a monetary donation there to help that ministry. And what a great way to celebrate our mothers. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to our head elder, Mr. Don Trudy. Well, I'm gonna let them hand out the flowers real quick and then we'll have a word of prayer, so. Okay.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray to you now in gratitude and praise for the gift of mothers. We thank you for the role they play in the family. We thank you for, the teach, for their teachings, their wisdom, their patience and understanding. Lord, we thank you for their physical, emotional, and spiritual gifts that they possess. Lord, we pray that you help mothers all across the world be a blessing upon their children or the children they care for. Whether they're delivering affirmation or discipline, we pray that you help every word and action to be done in love. On this Mother's Day, we pray that children throughout the world will take special time to honor their mothers. Lord, we pray that these mothers act as a blessing beyond their homes, reaching into extended families, their communities, their churches and schools. May you guide each of them into fulfilling their purpose on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Don. Let's celebrate and give thanks to God for our mothers this morning. Thank you, ladies. We bless you and honor you today. Thank you. You may be seated. Please rise now as we go to the Lord as his people for a moment of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly as your people, but with confidence before your throne, and we give you thanks today that you place before us opportunities to make an incredible difference. And so, Father, give us the eyes of faith to see those opportunities, to step into them with courage that more and more people would come into a relationship with you as you work through our lives. Father, on this Mother's Day, we give you thanks for our moms and for their influence and their love, their compassion. Father, in, in, enliven them today and, and refresh the, the joy of their salvation in their spirits that you would give them rest. And Lord, you would give them refreshment and wisdom. Father, we lift up our nation before you this morning. There are so many things going on in our government and communities around the world that need your wisdom and need your touch of unity. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit would move, that you would guard and protect our leaders, that you would be with our military and first responders, watch and guard and protect them as they protect our freedoms and allow us to be here today worshiping you, Lord. And so, Father, this morning all across this room, there are concerns on people's hearts and minds. There are those that are struggling with decisions, that are praying for children, that are praying for healing and relationships and provision. And so, Lord, we bring all of those before your throne this morning because you are a graceful God and a good Father. And we pray the prayer that your Son taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 